we're going to talk mainly about, well, today we're going to talk about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and how they may affect human health. Some of the things that we know, some of the things that we believe, and some of the things we just don't know. So here on the first slide, we see a couple of different ways in which you may be exposed to uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. I, I also tried to span the gamut here of voluntary exposures, and you see this nice gentleman over here who uh, I was saying, I think he's trying to smoke 200 cigarettes at once. It's either 200 or 400. Uh, I'm not sure why. It may have been. <laughs> I'm guessing this was in North Carolina. <laughs> anyway, here in the middle, something I'm very familiar with in Texas, a good steak. Uh, grilled meat. As, uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute, and then exhaust. And so here we have an inhalation exposure, right? And here we have one through, primarily through ingestion. One that's uh, also uh, the exhaust down here, you would expect to be exposed to PAHs through inhalation of that material, but also through <coughs> dermal uh, contact with that stuff on your skin, of course, much lower levels. Okay, so let's talk about what we know about the health effects of PAHs. Uh, I wouldn't say that there's great evidence for short-term effects of PAHs on their own. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of studies have been done on substances that contain PAHs as part of a mixture. Okay, and so generally, what we describe is that exposures to these mixtures cause nausea, vomiting, and so forth. Okay, but in terms of a, so that those are the things that we look for in people. You know, I, I don't think nausea, vomiting, the nausea and vomiting were my. Uh, that those were my side effects when I tried to smoke a cigarette in college, so maybe that's what is going on. Uh, Long-term health effects we understand a lot better, and the best understood of these is definitely cancer, as I described, because most, a lot of what we know about carcinogenesis, we learn from BAP and, and several others, but of course BAP is one of the prototypical carcinogens that we look at. Kidney and liver damage um, have also been uh, noted, breathing difficulties long-term as opposed to short-term, decreased immune function, immunotoxicity is a, is a is the, the weight of evidence on that is getting much, much stronger as we go through. And then this is sort of, I would say, the newest area in which there's been a lot of focus. So uh, we've been talking about this, and it's, there are very strong epidemiological associations with uh, delayed, cognitive impair, uh, delayed cognitive development, um, slightly decre decreased IQ, attention span, things like that, things that are a little harder for us to quantify, uh, probably associated with maternal or even paternal uh, exposure to PAHs. Um, and those have been pretty well characterized, it's safe to say. Everybody knows a good bit about the occupational exposures to PAHs, but the non-occupational ones have, have really started to come to the forefront. Um, and this is something I'm interested in, non-occupational exposures. So inhalation, obviously, uh, the most obvious one, and the one that's associated with the most health risk is tobacco. I don't think you know, that comes as a, a galloping shock to anyone. One that's been getting a lot of attention, of course, in the last about 30 years, I think, has been the exhaust. As, as we've seen our air quality improve, um, you know, this is something that we've really been focused on, uh, except for Houston, I should say. Houston hasn't improved that much. That's where I'm from. Um, but remember that PAHs are ubiquitous because they're not only created by anthropogenic processes like industry or car grinding or you grilling a steak, they're also created by forest fires. And basically, anytime anything burns, you're going to have some PAHs created as a result of that. So, but pr the primary route of ingestion, uh, of exposure for people uh, who don't work in one of the workplaces we've talked about is through the diet. And, and that's, that's been held up through almost every study of the subject that's been done. So, for example, a grilled steak, you know, has a somewhat notable uh, <laughs> concentration of benzoylpyrene, 4.5 uh, nanograms per gram parts per trillion, billion. Um, but I'm also interested in incidental ingestion of dust and soil, and that's always, this is a driver of remediation at, at super fun sites, as you might expect. So a couple of years ago, I had uh, the pleasure of meeting Barbara and Peter at the uh, Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry Conference, and that would have been in New Orleans, yeah, uh, two years ago. So I'm very interested in dust, and we're gonna talk more about dust in a minute, but I saw this, uh, I saw this paper, and uh, I had spotted a little bit of their work while I was a consultant, so I was very excited to get to meet the two of them after um, having you know, sort of known about their work from afar and get to sit down and discuss it with them. So this became very much of interest to me because house dust is sort of a hot topic when it comes to human exposure. Everybody wants to know what the relevance of dust is to our lives. And we know that it's somewhat relevant, at least with regards to exposure, and the health effects are starting to come into clearer focus. <coughs> So I think the biggest one we're talking about, the, the, most, the, the contaminant that's been characterized the most with regard to dust is definitely lead, from lead-based paint, right? Those chips become 
you know, you get lead paint, it chips off and it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller particles until your two-year-old toddler wanders over the windowsill and is playing around, puts her hand down and then puts her hand in her mouth and that's, that's an exposure pathway. And it's been very well demonstrated that you can wipe a kid's hand off and analyze the amount of lead on there and correlate it directly to their concentration in their blood. It's, an, it's a fantastic correlation. So we know that it's a sig significant for lead. PBDEs is good. Pesticides is also pretty well known. Dioxins and furans is something that I worked on when I was a consultant. Exposure is mediated through dust and something uh, I wouldn't say we understand terribly well, but we're getting a better grip on almost every day. And uh, PAHs is another one. There was a, there was a study done in the, in the Southwest called N-Hexis in which they were looking at, at multiple pathway exposures and dust was one of the ones they looked at. Metals, PAHs, pesticides were the main ones they talked about. But we expect this pathway to be especially relevant for young children, like I said. These are, these are little brain damaged people, I understand. But they're little, little kids who are wandering around and they're constantly trying to understand the world by touching and tasting everything, okay? And so it's, you know, this, this is what we're really talking about. The, you know, you would expect in a dust exposure that most of their, what they're gonna get is gonna be in the earliest years of their life. So when it comes to this, um, my curiosity was, since we know that the majority, typically the majority of, of your exposure to PAHs is going to be through ingestion of your food, real uh, ingestion of your food. So I was, we started asking the question of whether or not um, intake, if, if you were to see a child who's exposed to dust um, in, in the types of environments Barbara and Peter studied in Austin, would we expect those intakes to be higher than a typical dietary intake for a child? And so what we did was we, we found a study, a very recent study actually, that's based on an EPA uh, model of exposure for dust. So um, taking, the, taking the data from the Austin study, we see, um, we started looking at a group of, that should be PAH, sorry, confusing myself. We looked at a particular group, a subgroup of the PAHs, the ones that are considered to be probable human carcinogens by the EPA. There are seven of these, and they are all, um, so what we basically did was we summed these, and the sum concentration is 43 and a half micrograms per gram in the, uh, in uh, house dust that's adjacent to coal tar sealed pavement. And, and, we're, and for the purposes of this, we're calling it coal tar affected house dust, or CSA, coal tar sealed asphalt affected house dust. But um, the urban house dust, sort of a, the house dust that's adjacent to unsealed pavement was you know, obviously considerably lower. And this was generally consistent with urban background if, if you look uh, pretty firmly over the literature. And as a point of comparison, we found a study uh, performed by Chuang et al. That's actually 99. and. We just uh, basically plugged this into the model and this is what we found. So here's your typical dietary uh, ingestion rate, right around 24.8. And then you can see much lower um, if you're just ingest incidental ingestion of house dust. So at the mean, you would expect it to be, you know, almost, or almost undistinguishable from background, uh, the exposure you have here. And the same thing at the 95th, well below, you know, a dietary dose. But at the mean, much above in the 60, um, 60 nanogram per kilogram uh, body weight range, and then over here, much, much higher in the 200, and I think it was 247 uh, nanogram per kilogram body weight. So this is just uh, what you're expecting if you're a, you're a kid eating. So if, you're, if you have a child who's living in an environment next to um, coal tar sealed pavement that has dust reminiscent of this, this is, you know, in this range is what you're gonna expect their pH concentration to, uh, dose to be on a daily basis from the ages to three to six. So significantly higher than an anticipated dietary dose. So our next question has to do with, are these intakes associated with uh, theoretical excess lifetime cancer risk? Sorry to throw out that <laughs> little jargon at you, but this is how, this is how uh, nerds, risk assessors like me think. What we're interested in is if people are exposed to this versus not exposed to it, how many excess cancers are we going to anticipate there being as a result of exposure? We also have some temporal exposure scenarios. Um, and essentially, these are sort of typical for a lifetime for if you're interested in delineating the, the importance of various stages of your life. So scenario one, we're looking at exposure to an urban background environment over a 70 year lifespan. And that's what the cancer slope factor is designed for, a 70 year lifespan. In, exposure, in uh, scenario two, we're looking at exposure to CSA affected soil and dust over a 70 year lifespan, okay? Do you, do you see those two? So 
urban background versus CSA effectiveness as defined by uh, USGS. And then the next one we were curious about what what are the risks associated with exposure to CSA affected media only in the first six years of your life, only in the first 18 years of your life, and then from 18 to 70. And the rest of that time we assume that your exposure was to something consistent with urban background. Okay. So these are our five temporal scenarios and I'll remind you of how these work as we go on. Okay. So here's our first output table. And these are called deterministic estimates because they're based on a single point value. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So here we have exposures to house dust only, exposures to soil only, and then combined exposures. We have our various scenarios, and here we have a central tendency exposure and a reasonable maximum exposure. I hope I've made this uh, a little more understandable by doing something like this. So for 70 years of living in an environment with soil and house dust consistent with an urban background, your risk would be expected to be just over um, 10 to the minus 6, okay? I'm sorry, I should explain that, 10 to the minus 6. That means that you would expect one additional person out of a million to get cancer. One in a million is 10 to the minus 6, okay? And, and keep in mind that, well, we'll talk, I'm sorry, we'll put that in context a little later. So um, for 70 years of living in an environment with soil and house dust consistent with those affected by coal tar-based pavement sealants, you would expect that number to be an order of magnitude higher, right? About 24 higher. Okay. So now we're going to look at the whole table, and you can see that 70 years of exposure to soil and house dust at the central tendency are associated with an excess lifetime cancer risk of over 1 in 10,000. 1 in 10,000 is where everyone gets interested. Some people are interested at 10 to the minus 6, okay? They want it to be examined more. Much more, most people are interested at 10 to the minus 5, and everybody's interested at 10 to the minus 4. If you calculate an excess lifetime cancer risk of 1 in 10,000, that's something you're going to possibly pick up on an epidemiological survey for sure. Okay, so that and the risk associated with that scenario was 40 times greater than that which would be expected in environments adjacent to unsealed pavement. Um, I, I think it's pretty obvious that most of the risk is, is associated with ingestion of the soil, uh, the CSA affected soil. So you can see 83% for this particular scenario uh, in this particular calculation. So exposures to uh, these coal tar affected uh, media that occur before the age of six are also associated with risk in excess of 10 to the minus four at the reasonable maximum. And remember, that's what EPA looks at when they're deciding on remediation for a Superfund site. So it's definitely something that we, we would uh, we would look at and, and say we need to look at harder. Okay. <coughs> so it's important when you do risk assessment, you can't, you know, it's, it's irresponsible to say we know everything about this. And so you have to come back and say there are certain things about this that we just don't know everything. And part of that has to do um, with a relatively small number of data points for soil and for settled house dust. And I, I definitely don't think it's a stretch to say that if you have, with, with the concentrations that you see in the dust that's on coal tar sealed pavement, you would get a significant exposure from even one hand to mouth motion that one might exceed a full day's exposure to the settled house dust. So I wouldn't be surprised at all. Just to, uh, to, to say this uh, clearly, deterministic and probabilistic risk analysis suggests that exposure to settled house dust and soil affected by coal tar based pavement sealants generates theoretical excess lifetime cancer risk in excess of 10 to the minus four. This is the kind of statement I hope you would expect to see at the end of the Superfund report.